everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Bill Murray. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where <laughs> My name is Bill Murray. Uh, I'm a researcher at the Leading Edge Forum. Uh, we're a global research and thought leadership program, and we're dedicated to helping clients reimagine their um, organizations. We've been around for 25 years, and we intend to be around for 25 more years, uh, particularly by working with people of the talent of Mr. Cicero and Mr. Wardley, who I have here with me. Um, Simone, would you um, kindly give our, our guests a quick introduction to yourself? Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, thanks for the for opening this and uh, for your kind words. Um, so basically, uh, I am uh, Simone, uh, original creator of uh, uh, what, uh, what of a design toolkit that is uh, dedicated to uh, multi-sided uh, businesses and strategies uh, called uh, the Platform Design Toolkit. Uh, more generally, I am a strategist uh, working in open uh, and uh, uh, collaborative business models since uh, uh, something like 15 years, probably. I've uh, been working widely in ha open hardware, open software, now open business models, and, uh, and, and that's it, more or less. Thank you. And uh, Simon, Mr. Wardley, would you please give us an introduction to yourself? Hello, Bill. Uh, yes, I'd be very happy to. My name is Simon Wardley. I, I work with the uh, Leading Edge Forum. I work for the Leading Edge Forum. I, I research into maps. Uh, maps are something which are uh, very uh, important to me. I, I think in terms of uh, com competition between companies in terms of maps. And so I created a way of mapping when I was the CEO of a software company. Uh, which was focused heavily in the open source world, which is also my background as well. So um, I, I, I'm the mapping chap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so um, can I start with you, Simone? Um, you've been working with Wardley Maps um, quite a quite a bit recently, and um, you've been using them to think through, I understand, uh, how to find new opportunities in ecosystems and new ways to think about platform strategies. And in your last post, you raised a very intriguing idea, this idea of a Z shape on a Wardley map. Could you tell us about that, please? Thanks. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I've personally been using Wordly mapping for uh, for long because it's uh, it, it was uh, always a precious um, way to uh, understand better the context where you were uh, with, with with which you were working. And then, therefore, you know, basically in the last uh, in the last couple of uh, months, uh, we have been. Uh, trying to uh, project, let's say, the work that we have been doing in the, in the platform context uh, into worldly mapping and see, uh, um, actually see what was coming up out of that. So it's not that uh, we have been thinking too much through this uh, beforehand, but it's really a result of using worldly mapping with platform thinking that we, uh, we saw this uh, uh, Z uh, shape um, value chain map, world lay map uh, emerging from uh, platform strategies. So basically, I think that in, in a few words, what we what we see uh, essentially with uh, uh, projecting aggregation strategies, what we call platforms, into world lay mapping, we see uh, a few um, constant, a few uh, recurring elements. And one for sure is this idea that. Uh, um, uh, these uh, aggregation strategies essentially standardize uh, some aspects, especially uh, transactions and uh, interaction uh, coordination between parties. And uh, on the other hand, they essentially allow uh, long tail to play 
uh, long tail dynamics to play out in terms of uh, customer and producers' expectations and, and interactions. So basically, platforms are about uh, producers and consuming uh, and consumers organ uh, self-organizing around their potential and their needs. Um, and uh, normally, they tend to uh, let people to and, and small players, let's say, to uh, try to uh, let's say have peculiar and, and, and particular and customized experiences. So this puts them on the left of the of the world they map. And on the other hand, you have this transaction uh, standardization that goes on the right. That's why you have this Z um, shape, let's say. Um, so this is a, we have seen this as a recurring element. And I think one uh, interesting bit to com complete, let's say, this opening uh, reflection on Z shape uh, is that there is a friction inherently between a standardized transaction mm, and a mm, customized experience. And I think uh, this idea uh, that connects uh, a standardized transaction with a, with a customized experience is this idea of uh, disobedience that we have been playing with in the, in the past year. So the question is, it, it looks like platform strategies, so market organizers, uh, they standardize, but at the same time, they leave uh, entities to play with the tools that they create. Uh, and this connects with Simon's point on uh, using ecosystem as a, uh, future sensing uh, engine, let's say. And also, I think uh, this is coming very strongly from from what uh, we have been researching in the last uh, in the last uh, couple of months. Simon, um, this sounds uh, like uh, innovate, leverage, commoditize. Is that right? Yes. Um, <laughs> so. The thing about maps is um, when you start mapping out the landscape, you start to discover there are different types of uh, repeating patterns uh, that occur. One of the things I, learn, uh, I use maps for is when I look at the context and I put down my strategic play, then I'll go back six months later and look at how it's changed and, and what I thought when I wrote the map and what patterns have appeared as a result of, of whatever action we've taken. And... I do this in a way that I've never done with business models before. I mean, you know, for me, it's it's, uh, it's something I've been doing for 13 years. And from that, uh, there are at least 30 common economic patterns which are useful for anticipation. So, you know, it uh, doesn't matter what it is. If there is supply and demand competition, then the item, the, the, the form of capital, whether it's activity, practice, data or knowledge, will evolve and become more industrial over time industrialized over time. So that's one pattern. Um, so there's 30 common economic patterns, about 40 universally useful patterns known as doctrine or principles of organization that have come out of maps. And uh, well, publicly, I talk about 63, but it's, it's over 100 different forms of gameplay of uh, manipulation of the environment. So if I, I look at something like ecosystems and think about gameplay, you've got alliances, co-creation, sensing engines like ILC, Tower and Mo, M Factor Markets, co-opting and intercession, Embrace Extend, uh, then you've got channel conflicts, disintermediation, then you've got aggregator. So, so this is a long, long list, and that's just a one, one small section of it. So if you think about this idea of a um, um, building some sort of uh, eco uh, platform play. Um, it's, it's inevitable that over time what will happen is people will build higher order systems based upon it if it's exposed as an API. And as that stuff evolves, the focus will shift on top. And so the underlying component will become less visible over time. And that's an important part of our, our industrial system. So if you look at a toaster, a toaster actually contains about 120 components inside it, all of them highly commoditized components. Um, and if you try to build a toaster from scratch, the entire supply chain from scratch, as Thomas Thwaite did, you spend nine months, you spend $1,000, you get something which vaguely looks like a toaster, and when you plug it in, it bursts into flames. But because of this process of industrialization, you can just go and buy a toaster for $40. So what's going to happen with your platforms, I'm afraid, is people will build on top and those things will become the new platforms. And your platform, if it's a single component, will increasingly become less visible, an important but less visible part of the supply chain, which is why 
you use the metadata, so you allow other people to innovate, to mine that metadata to spot those new patterns, which you then commoditize to component and utility service use yourself. And that's the whole point of the ILC model. And it's just one pattern of that, of the many different forms of gameplay. Uh, so what you're doing is you're getting everybody else to innovate for you. You're mining the metadata, leveraging that spot new patterns, which you commoditize to component services, which other people then build on top for you. And the key trick is if you play that game well, then your rate of apparent innovation, because you're not doing it, everybody else is doing it for you, your rate of customer focus and your rate of efficiency, so economies of scale, now all increase with the size of the ecosystem building on top of your component services. So, so that's the basic ILC gameplay. Something I wrote about 2005, 2006, it was part of the Zimki play. Um, it's quite a powerful sort of model. Uh, compared to the sort of, well, I think it's quite powerful. Other people seem to think it's quite useful. Um, compared to the old models, which was you could be one of customer-focused, innovative, or efficient. Well, great for the 1990s, pretty much broken in 2005, 2006. Mm, pretty much dead today. Thank you. Um, Simone, um, your post uh, on the Z-shape, um, you mention four typical evolutions, which I which I uh, got the impression actually made the Z shape happen. And I thought they were very profound because when you're looking for a platform in a potential ecosystem and you find potential ecosystem partners, you're also looking at those four evolutions to see how they would work. Am I right? yeah 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 so basically um you know i think all these uh, um connects with uh, a broader um basically we are trying to develop this broader understanding of uh, um not just you know the, the, the particular behavior of an aggregator and therefore these four traits for example no uh, but also um trying to contextualize let's say these into more general evolutions in the digital market so one, you know, for example, when I was listening to Simon, one, one question that uh, he have and that we are trying to figure out, um, you know, everybody's talking, for example, about these uh, fangs. So the, the, the GAFAs or the fangs, whatever, no? So it, it will be very interesting trying to understand, you know, what is the role that these kind of uh, uh, huge infrastructures uh, are getting into the future? And... What does it mean for us as business designers or organizational designers? Um, what kind of businesses we are supposed to design in a future where these entities will grab, you know, uh, increasing layers of the market? And so my, my impression is, you know, basically that uh, we are going to design smaller and smaller platforms, platforms. So we are going to organize a smaller and smaller markets on top of larger and larger infrastructures. So I see this kind of, uh, uh, I would say, bimodal ways, let's say, of the economy to, to play out. And basically having these uh, larger and larger platform infrastructures on the, on the lower side of the value chain and smaller and smaller uh, mark, what we call market networks. So essentially, um, the more platforms that organize uh, a particular uh, market, let's say, you know, a particular niche market. Uh, it's, it's funny because in, in, my, in my writing, I call them niche aggregators. And uh, there was a guy, you know, a very uh, a great uh, friend uh, uh, from Ron Kertzich from NG. He told me, you know, it's kind of counterinteractive to think about the niche aggregators because they, sh they are supposed to be, you know, like, uh, wide, you know, and aggregate everything. So I, I, I think if there is something that I would like to um, pick uh, Simon's uh, thinking about, it's really this, you know, trying to understand how is this digital market shaping, you know, is it, is it becoming like large infrastructure on, on the bottom, small platforms on top, in, in, and empowering this small long tail market? So what, whatever, what, what any other uh, pattern you see in the, in the future? Wow, what a what a question. Okay, so th there are many, many different aspects uh, to that question. So that's 
So I, I, we'll have to go through all of them, I'm afraid. <laughs> so we'll start off with the basic shift of uh, something from product to utility. Now, that basic shift is associated with efficiency in terms of provision, uh, rapid scale of development and speed in terms of building higher order systems, exploration of novel and new things built on top, so expanding uh, the adjacent possible, uh, so associated with new sources of value or worth. It's also associated with inertia to the past industry, uh, nonlinear change, exponential change, we call it a punctuated equilibrium. Um, it, it's associated with a change of practice, a co-evolution of practice. There's a whole range of things that that simple shift from product to utility or product to more commodity forms is associated with. And not only that, you can roughly anticipate where it's going, when it's going to happen uh, through the use of weak signals. Now, the thing about this is the question of does it centralize or decentralize? In fact, centralization, decentralization, whether it becomes a single provider or a market of providers, uh, depends upon another set of forces. So there's a difference between the shift from product to commodity and industrialization and the question of centralization, decentralization. One of the major factors in the centralized decentralization is the gameplay of competitors. So if one competitor makes the move, and the others are completely and utterly hopeless, it will tend to centralize. Whereas if a competitor makes the move and the others are you know, of a decent level of strategic play, you're more likely to get a decentralized environment. So if we talk about uh, something like um, uh, the shift from compute from uh, uh, product to utility, I mean, if we go back to 2008 when I was at Ubuntu, I, I had various talks with all the big hardware vendors and they just laid out the patterns of the game and how it was easy to fragment the market by creating an AWS clone, creating a price war to increase demand beyond the ability to supply. That would naturally uh, fragment the market so you would get a competitive market. And then I explained to them they're all going to refuse to do this because of inertia, because of pre-existing business model. And the reality is it's centralized basically because Amazon played a good game and most of its competitors were hopeless. Now, so you've got that shift from product to utility and the question of centralized decentralization. Once it's centralized, if you want to break it, you've got to play a game of last man standing. And the only people who really seem to be good at that game is probably Alibaba. Now, once you've got that component, if somebody's playing an ILC type game, so people are building on top their mining metadata, commoditizing new components and themselves moving up the stack. Well, if you're in the space of building on top, you can happily survive as long as the doctrine and principles of your organization are good and better, ideally better than the person providing the service. And the reason for this is that doctrine, it seems to be associated with adaptability. So somebody like Netflix can happily build and survive on top of Amazon because it's got the right sort of doctrine, the right sort of environment. It's a very adaptable type structure. Whereas if you're one of these more sort of uh, traditional silo type organizations, you're going to struggle to survive because you'll build something, it will get eaten up um, and you will have problems adapting. So it's perfectly possible to survive on top if, for, if, for example, you've got the right sort of doctrine and you've got an adaptable environment. Now, what you can also do is if you game play it well enough, you can build the component services on top, which hides the underlying components. So again, going back to the hardware vendors, another part of the play was you build the platform. You build the platform on top that everybody uses because it hides the underlying component and therefore, the people providing the underlying component, all they see is the platform growing and not what things are being built with it. So you play the game of mining the metadata. Um, and unfortunately, that's not happening at this moment because Amazon is too good and its competitors are pretty hopeless. So it's moved up the stack and it's going away in the serverless space as well. But that doesn't mean that game can't be played higher up the stack if you know what you're actually doing. So you've got these interesting changes in terms of um, the shift in product to utility, it's predictability, it's a form of disruption which we can actually anticipate rather than product to product disruption or substitution. Um, the question of centralization, decentralization is a question of gameplay. 
um, you can counter a highly industrialized commodity player with a game of last man standing if you know what you're doing. There's probably only Alibaba in that space at the moment. You can happily survive building small components on top as long as you've got a highly adaptable uh, culture. So Netflix can happily carve out a big space for itself because of its adaptable nature. You can um, build a, a higher level system which cuts off the, the flow of information to the, pl to the player if you know how to play the game. Uh, the brutal reality is most organizations seem fairly oblivious to the environment they exist in. They don't actually understand the context. So probably most of these games won't actually make any sense to them at all. So I'm afraid just get used to Amazon chewing up a lot of things until people start behaving a bit more like Amazon, maybe a bit more, uh, a bit more like Netflix, a bit more like Alibaba. So that's that's my answers. Simone, do you, do you have... Another question for Simon. No, I mean, I, I, I really, I think it is a really a key uh, reflection to have, you know, because now we deal with a lot of companies that want to, you know, innovate, build new positions. But I think it's very important to understand how the market is uh, evolving. So where are we going? Uh, so what is a business that you can design as an organization? You no. Know? So as I understand from what um, uh, Simon just shared, and also what our our uh, considerations lately. Uh, we need to get familiar to, let's say, a larger and larger chunk of the economy working uh, on the basis of, you know, completely different dynamics as we were used, for example, in the 20th century. So with very few players, um, you know, can, kind of uh, enabling and, and empowering a large part of the economy, let's say. Um, I would say that it looks like uh, the idea of... Uh, of uh, uh, an empowering infrastructure, enabling infrastructure, is kind of, uh, it looks like uh, the, the further evolution of a utility. It's something like, uh, you know, uh, after the utility, you have this large empowering infrastructures like a AWS or Amazon itself or Alibaba or whatever. So, so the question I think we really need to answer is, what can be built now? So you made the example of Netflix, which is, uh, I think you're right. You said, you know, you can exist on top of the GAFA or the FANG, let's call it as you want, uh, if you are a highly adaptable organization. And what I understand from highly adaptable organization is a, it means an organization that is able to design and consolidate these vertical experiences. For example, Netflix done it around entertainment, video entertainment. But you can do that around, uh, I don't know, uh, travel, like Airbnb, you can do that uh, uh, around maybe other industries. Maybe in that case, you can be a little bit smaller than Airbnb or Netflix. But the question is, how, you know, how is it going to, uh, to be the real, what is going to be the real opportunity, especially for existing organizations and existing companies? Uh, what can they build uh, uh, in case they can become adaptable and, and, and you know, experience-focused as Netflix and Airbnb. Huh? Uh, so essentially, I think uh, this is something that everybody is trying to understand now. Uh, and in the process, of course, uh, tens or maybe thousands of incumbents, uh, they will likely go out of business because uh, larger chunks of their business are going to be eaten by uh, the GAFAs. Large parts of their business are going to be eaten by um, uh, these nimble, adaptable players on top of them. So they are kind of in the middle, seeing their their economy being, uh, you know, uh, being essentially uh, uh, eaten by other players, and they uh, they seemingly cannot figure out how to do what to do in in the process. Gosh, right, um, really, really, really good questions. Um, thematic patterns, which are patterns which change the environment, uh, things like everything evolves uh, through supply and demand competition. We have inertia, um, uh, industrialization of components enables higher order systems. There's about 30 of those. And then you've got the, um, the gameplay, uh, which, you know, it talks publicly 60 odd, there's over 100 really. Um, and then we talk about uh, doctrine, universally useful principles. Now, the doctrine, um, is associated with adaptability of the organization. And there's about 40 of them. So I'm not going to go through 40 because um, it would just be too too boring to do online. But uh, um, 
if I have a look at, you know, well, I actually break them into phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. So phase one are the super basic doctrine that you should do. And phase two, then are slightly more advanced. And by the time you get to phase four, um, you know, the structure of the organization is much more um, uh, self-organizing. It's much more uh, designed to cope with evolution and change. But let's start with phase one. Uh, these are the simple principles. Know your users. Use a systematic mechanism of learning. Uh, focus on high situational awareness. Use a common language, an essential part of collaboration. Challenge assumptions. Focus on user needs. Remove bias and duplications. Think small, as in know the details, and use appropriate methods. So not one size fits all, uh, whether it's finance or project management or whatever. And so they, those are the phase one, and they're really simple, basic things. And it, it, it's amazing how many companies are shockingly poor at this. They don't really understand their users. They don't understand their user needs. They do one size fits all. Let's outsource everything. Let's agile everything. Uh, they have endless amounts of duplication and bias in the organization. They think big. They don't break things into small components. Uh, they don't apply constraints. They barely ever challenge the assumptions of what they are actually building. They have poor situational awareness. I mean, it's just red across the whole lot. Now, that's phase one. Just getting good at that will give you a starting point. And then you've got to get all the way through all the different doctrine until I would describe you as an organization that is able to adapt, which means you understand the environment, you understand some, some basics of how to treat things, and you've designed a, an organization, a structure that's able to adapt. If you do all that well, you can quite happily survive and live on top of all these component services. If you don't, then you're a target. Um, and you, you survive for as long as everybody else in your industry is just as bad as you at that area of the, those areas of doctrine. I mean, it, you, you can happily survive if everybody else is utterly useless. Uh, the problem is when somebody comes into your space who, who isn't. So, so the first thing is just focusing on the doctrine, cleaning up your organization, stopping almost the self-harm that organizations do. Now, you, once you've got through that, then you can start thinking about how do we actively uh, attack the market to bend it to our favor. That assumes you understand uh, the landscape and you're also able to anticipate. So you've got to understand those like 30 common economic patterns uh, that things evolve, that they enable higher order systems, creating new sources of value. And assuming you've got that far, then it's a question of gameplay. Um, and there's an enormous wealth of gameplay. I mentioned the different sorts of ecosystem plays, co-creation, sensing engines, tower and moat. There's all sorts of competitor plays, fragmentation plays, reinforcing competitor inertia, sapping, ambush. I mean, I use this stuff against Microsoft and uh, Red Hat when we were at Ubuntu. We went from 2% of the operating system market. It cost me about half a million, 80 months. We, we took over 70% of all cloud computing. And I mean, today still, and this is eight years later, Ubuntu had dominates that space. And there's all sorts of accelerators, market enablement, uh, open approaches are fantastic for industrial. So there's all sorts of games you can play. But the problem is everybody wants to jump to the game, but they don't understand their landscape. They can't anticipate the environment because they haven't learned those basic patterns and their organizational structure is just wrong, as in their doctrine is dreadful. So they all want to jump to the strategy as though strategy will magically solve this problem um, uh, when, when in fact the, the Titanic's got a great big hole in it. Um, but, uh, oh, it gets even worse, uh, is they come up with sort of magic ways of, uh, uh, you, know, you mentioned bimodal. I'm not, that's a terrible structure, by the way, uh, that people are trying to adopt, it creates all sorts of problems in an organization. But I often see this as well, people without understanding principles and doctrine of how they should operate, uh, you know, moving deck chairs on the, on the deck of the Titanic as though that will magically solve the whole problem. So there's a lot that can be done. Um, but it does depend upon your understanding the environment, the climatic patterns, that, uh, and then learning the different forms of gameplay and using those and the, the constraints within the system to your favor. Um, the reality is most organizations seem a long, long way from that.
Uh, Bill, can I just ask a quick uh, follow-up question and then I'll leave it to you, I promise, because I see the, I don't see any question coming on the YouTube, so I take this uh, liberty, if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> So, my, my, because I think this is really the, the point of this conversation we are getting. You know? So, the question is it looks like to me that uh, all these uh, uh, strategic awareness me me methods you, you have been working with in the last decades, um, it's, it really it's lo it looks like it applies to um, the industrial uh, market. You know? So, basically, everything is getting industrialized. And my impression is that in this process, we are seeing a consolidation more and more. Uh, so basically now you have dominant players, everything is getting consolidated. So the question is, the remaining part of the market hmm, is what uh, is really intriguing and, and still very big because there's a lot in the economy that can be organized. My, my, my feeling is that it, be, it, uh, uh, it, it works on different rules. It's like when I say by model, it looks like you know there is part of the economy that is working as you mentioned, and but it's really now very competitive, and you are going to compete with the giants, and it's really impossible for you to to get hold of them. And then there is what we call uh, you know normally we use this word uh, sometimes when we when we speak with our customers and our adopters this idea of micro massive opportunities. So there is a lot. It's, it's like there's a long tail of business there mm -hmm. that we need to we need to design. Mm -hmm. But the question is, it looks like this long tail of business really it works according to different rules, which are more rules of, uh, you know, for example, relational understanding, mm -hmm. co-creation, cooperative, and you know, collaborative. Um, uh, building of uh, uh, value proposition. Sometimes, lastly, you know, uh, I want to bring this on the table, blockchain and tokens, you know, the, these new technologies coming up. It's fascinating sometimes to me that it looks like the ecosystem, the long tails are kind of uh, creating tools so that uh, a business can grow, uh, you know, out of, uh, I would say, just out of the expression of the ecosystem. So it's like the ecosystem itself is expressing its own organizing entity, you know, mm -hmm. thanks to this technology. And it looks to me that we are getting to, to this point that, you know, we know how the market works. We know now that giants are dominating, but now there is a whole lot of new things that we need to organize and the rules look very different. Mm -hmm. You know, just uh, I'm wondering what, what you guys think about that. Yep. So really good point. So th there's one side in terms of uh, industrialization, the, the whole industrialized side off the map. There's a whole forms of um, the gameplays are all context specific. So some are used to drive things across a map. Some are used in the more industrialized. Some is used on the left hand side, which is the uncharted space. That's where they work better. So when you and you look at the different forms of um, uh, gameplay, you've got the industrialization. Um, there's a potential for a yo-yo uh, between centralized and decentralized. Um, that all depends upon the gameplay of competitors and a number of other factors as well. So, I mean, you're seeing this a little bit with electricity um, that we've got highly industrialized, it's standardized, etc. But then now there's the opportunity for some decentralization of provision. So there is a constant yo-yo between centralized, decentralized, and it depends on different factors that than those that drive the evolution of something. Now, if you are living, you know, it, it, well, we all live in a world where there are industrialized components, uh, which we build on top of. If you're playing the games in that uncharted space, then a different set uh, of uh, forms of gameplay are, are required. Uh, so that is very much the world of experimentation, and um, that there is no certainty in the uncharted space. So you have to do large numbers of different experiments. There's usually a very long tail of things that can be built, some of which may become highly successful. But the problem with the uncharted space is that by its very nature, it is uncertain. So the example being electricity enabling things like radio, television, computing, it also enabled the refrigeration blanket. 
So it was a blanket that you would plug in and it would keep you cool on a, uh, a, a, a warm uh, summer's night. Now, if you asked somebody, well, if you'd asked me back in those days, what's going to be more successful, the refrigeration blanket or a, or a box which had, had moving pictures in it, I would imagine it would have, I would have responded the refrigeration blanket. And that's because that space is unknown. It's the adjacent unexplored, it, it's uncertain. So we've got all sorts of weird and wonderful people. The American, uh, uh, what were they called, Electrotherapeutic Association. Uh, they were all about giving people electric shocks because that improved your health. Well, it turns out we discovered it actually doesn't. But um, it, it might have done, <laughs> but people were exploring. So there's all sorts of games in that space that you can actually uh, use uh, around experimentation, how you design constructs things, your investment approaches, etc. And then there's, of course, a different set of games in the middle and also have different games to drive things from left to right. So, um, so in terms of um, where we are at the moment, yes, we are seeing centralization. Doesn't mean it will stay centralized. It, um, it can decentralize, and that, and when we talk about decentralization, that can be in two forms: provision and power. So, um, provision is if you think about cloud. Um, there's no reason why, you know, Amazon, for example, shouldn't, um, and it is with things like uh, Lambda and uh, Greengrass, decentralized provision everywhere. So basically, uh, Amazon serverless is everywhere. It's in your device. It's in, it's in, it's, it's online. Now, what you've got there is centralization of power, decentralization of provision. There, you know, when something becomes industrialized, you do get, can get that yo-yo between centralization, decentralization centralization it can occur on both provision and power now the games that you want to play building on top are very different from the games that you want to do uh, when you're industrializing and uh, the problem is if you can't see the environment you can't see the context then it's 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 really easy to mess this up and, and, and the classic example for me of this uh, well there are many would probably be f uh, first mover fast follower because i'm always asked this question should should i be a first mover or fast follower and the answer is both um, you should be a first mover to industrialize if the opportunity exists, but you should always be a fast follower to the novel and new. So you should let others create the novel and new, and you should be a fast follower if possible to that. Now, if you're in the, if you are creating the novel and new, you want to protect yourself as much as possible um, uh, and create advantages for yourself in that space. And the games that you play are, are very different. So the answer to the first move of fast follower is neither is not one or the other. It's always both. Uh, it depends upon the landscape. It's a bit like um, a disruption. Uh, there are at least two different forms. One which you can anticipate, product utility. One you can't anticipate, product product substitution. So cloud is a form of predictable disruption, and uh, Nokia versus Apple is a form of unpredictable uh, uh, disruption. And the games and techniques that you use against those are very, very, very different. And it's the same with project management. There's no such thing as one size fits all. You use multiple different methods all at the same time. Agile over here, Lean over here, Six Sigma over here. Um, none of this stuff you can really do unless you see the context. So my issue with most of the stuff, most of the stuff that I hear about strategy and most of the stuff I hear when people talk about digitization and ecosystem plays is they don't actually understand the context. And if you don't understand the context, given that most of these forms of gameplay are context specific, it's just random shooting in the Thank you. Um, if I'm sorry, you're mute to Bill. We don't hear you. Yeah, I think Bill's on mute. Right, gentlemen, you hear me now? Sorry, um, age and technology and all that. So we're 41 minutes in, um, huge amount of information there to digest. Um, and I think it would be good now to, to bring this to a close. Um, I made some observations um, during the conversation, and um, uh, here they are. Um, the, uh, Simone has discovered a Z shape. 
on a Wardley map. And it's really quite important because it, um, it shows a space on a Wardley map that is the natural space that a platform or an aggregator can play. And I guess if you're outside that space, you need to worry. So it's really important that people building new platforms, looking into ecosystems, use this kind of view, which Simone is building into the platform toolkit. And these platforms could be platform cooperatives. They could have market network models. And I love the term niche aggregators because they can be really small. Um, and uh, Simon Wardley said, uh, in answer to the question, how do you know whether they're centralized or decentralized? Well, it, it depends on the gameplay of the level below you, the infrastructure, uh, whether they're playing it very well, and also how good your doctrine is. In fact, the, the real takeaway for me was, how do you survive? How do you live on top of these great big utilities if you are a platform cooperative or a niche aggregator? Well, you get your doctrine right. You go through situational awareness and you clear all that red away in the first level of doctrine and you try and get it to amber or green. And if you don't do that, you will not survive. And if you do do that and you go up to the second and the third level, then you can start thinking about gameplay, which brings me very neatly to the evolving canon of gameplay, which Mr. Wardley brought in through mapping and has generously said a number of times, there's lots of other gameplay out there. Well, now we have some disciples. We have myself and Simone, uh, myself in the recent Liberating Platforms report, um, uh, using Simon's uh, uh, mapping gameplays, we found dig new digital versions of them, and we found things, uh, new gameplays that we were guided towards using mapping practice. And in Simone's toolkit, there's a growing canon of gameplays, which are really, really rather good. And so I'm delighted that mapping has come back into the latest developments in, um, in the toolkit. So gentlemen, those are just my observations. Um, I'm going to listen to the podcast after because there was so much in there and I couldn't write it down fast enough. Um, and so with your permission, I'd like to draw this to a close by just mentioning to our current listeners and our podcast listeners that Simone is running a platform design masterclass in London, uh, hosted by the LEF in our auditorium in between King's Cross and St Pancras. It's a two-day masterclass on the 15th and the 16th of November, uh, where you'll, you'll get to learn uh, some of the things you've heard about today and the very successful platform, uh, uh, how to use the platform toolkit, which has a growing community of people around it. Simone, would you like to say something? Well, I mean, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, this time. It was amazing. I think I also have a material for another blog post at least. And uh, uh, I think at this point on power and provision, it's also uh, provisioning. It's also another very interesting point to, to research. Uh, connected with what you said uh, about, for example, platform cooperatives, the blockchain, and so on. So coming back to your point on the masterclass, um, yeah, I mean, we're going to have this masterclass. Unfortunately, we are now uh, sold out already, so people can register to the wait list. Uh, since we are most, um, more or less at, um, two, three weeks or two and a week and a half at, uh, from the event, uh, it looks like we need to organize another one soon <laughs> in London. <laughs> So I think uh, this is a start of a, a collaboration we are having with the Leading Edge Forum. I really look forward to imagine, uh, you know, how to develop new uh, strategic tools for people that want to explore this new, this brave new world that we are trying to understand. And uh, really, you know, uh, register. There is another, actually, there is another uh, masterclass coming up in Madrid and Paris already that you can join. Otherwise, just register to the wait list and we'll see what happens in the next uh, few days. Thanks again for hosting us, uh, Bill. It was amazing to chat and Simon. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and hopefully we'll see people again soon. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye now.